النبي أولى بالمؤمنين من أنفسهم وأزواجه أمهاتهم بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولهم بعد uh, So alhamdulillah today after very very many many months if not years of promising we're going to be starting, inshallah ta'ala, the series on the mothers of the believers. And uh, I had given a lecture two, three weeks ago uh, regarding the, uh, the issue of the family of the Prophet sallallahu And very briefly, just a few minutes, just a quick refresher before we move on. Because now that we're starting the mother of the believers, uh, we do need to be very, very explicit about the definition of the mother of the believers and the blessings of the mother of the believers before we move on to uh, some of the categories of the women that the Prophet sallallahu married. So we begin with Surah Al-Ahzab verse 6. Uh, surah Al-Ahzab is really the main surah in the Quran that deals with the uh, wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in verse 6, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says, An-Nabiyu awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim wa azwajuhu ummahatuhum. An-Nabi is awla bil mu'minin. Awla here means that he is more of a protector and more worthy of the believers than they are for themselves. Meaning, he has more of a right over them than they have over themselves. He is more concerned about them than they are concerned about themselves. He has more authority over them than they have over themselves. He is the Prophet. So, An-Nabi awla bil mu'minin anfusihim wa azwajuhu ummahatuhum. And his wives are therefore their mothers. His wives are their mothers. Here, of course, azwaj or zoj, we all know zoj means in Arabic, it means the second or the pair or the dual. And generally speaking, it means spouse, as we know, but not all the time. For example, Allah says, Woman kulishain khalaqna zawjaini, from everything we created pairs. Here, zoj here means pair. And also, Allah says in the Quran, azwajahum. Gather those that have done wrong and their azwaj. Azwaj here doesn't mean their spouses. And those that have helped them, their partners. But in the context of this verse, ummahatuhum. Obviously what is meant is the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They are their umm, the ummahat. So what is the umm here? Because it's obviously not biological mother. What is the meaning of um over here? It's obviously not biological mother. The concept or the notion of um, uh, I've mentioned a number of times before, and the Arabs, they call the origin of everything the um. So anything that comes from something else, the source of, also the, uh, the gist of, it is called the um. So for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, mentions uh, the Quran as having the ummul kitab. He mentions the lawh al-mahfuz um, as being wa innahu fi ummil kitab. He mentions Mecca as being umm al-qura. So umm al-qura here means not the mother of the cities, but basically uh, the primary source or the queen of all cities. Of course, umm also means mother. So Allah says in the Quran with regards to Prophet Musa, faradanaka ila ummik. We return you to your mother. And foster mothers are also called um in the Arabic language. Allah says in the Quran, Wa ummahatukum min rada'a. Your mothers from fostering. So Allah calls the foster mother also a mother. But when it comes to the wives of the Prophet wasallam, mother is neither biological nor fostering. It is a third category that is unique to them. There's only one group of people that have been called mother in this fashion, and that is the mother of the believers. And Al-Qurtubi, Ibn Kathir, others they mention. The meaning of mother here is a mother of tarbiyah and a mother of hub and a mother of protection. So the mother, when we say our mothers, the mother of tarbiyah, and the mother of love, and the mother of protection. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explicitly honored the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam over and above the women of their times by ascribing the highest level of respect the highest level of love that any person has to a female, and that is to their mother. And Allah says, His wives are the mothers of the mu'mineen. And the mu'min, of course, is higher than Muslim. Meaning, the leaders of the mu'min, their mothers are the, believer, are the, the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. The best of the believers, their mothers are the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. Qatada, the famous student of Ibn Abbas said, 
By this verse, Allah has honored the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ibn Abi Hatim, the famous Mufassir, he said, They are their mothers in terms of their sanctity. For they are haram on every believer, just like his own mother is haram for him. So, the concept of motherhood here then obviously is not biological and it is not foster. Basically, a number of things are being mentioned. The mothership that is established for the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it is the mothership of loving, of honoring, of respecting, of learning from, tarbiyah, of learning from, and also of making marriage haram. Obviously, there is no mahramiyya. The mothers of the believers are not mahrams because Allah explicitly has mentioned that they need to take extra hijab. Men cannot enter in upon them like they enter in upon their mothers. They're not the mothers of that nature. Rather, they are the mothers of tarbiyah and love. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explicitly mentions in the Quran other characteristics about the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it is essential that we quickly go over two or three of the verses in Surah Al-Ahzab. Uh, because again, it wouldn't be appropriate to start talking about the azwaj without mentioning what Allah says in the Quran regarding them. So... Uh, we begin with verse number 28 very quickly we'll go over them because really we should go over from 28 to basically uh, 35 we're going to do very quickly that Allah says in the Quran verse 28 Ya nabiyu, that O Prophet Qulli azwajika say to your wives in kuntunna turidhin allaha in kuntunna turidhin al-hayata dunya wa zinataha if you want this world and its beauty then come and I will provide for you all that you want. And I will let you go a beautiful letting go. Meaning I'll divorce you a beautiful divorce. وَإِن كُنْتُنَّ تُرِذِنَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ And if you want Allah and His Messenger, وَالدَّارَ الْآخِرَةِ And the hereafter, then indeed Allah has prepared for the good doers amongst you أَجْرًا عَظِيمًا A massive reward. Now, these two verses were revealed as we shall discuss inshallah when we get there in more detail. And I've already mentioned them uh, in the Sira lectures. In the fifth year of the Hijrah, when the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when the money began to come in and the conquests and the, the, the delegations, well, the de de delegations would come in a year or two, but essentially the livelihood was now better than it was in early Medina. And the wives of the process and being regular women there's nothing supernatural about them they desired a better livelihood and they desired a better sustenance and a better everything and they kept on asking 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 until this caused the prophet to basically uh, leave them for one month the story i went over it in the seerah then allah revealed these verses and these verses basically gave the wives of the process a choice you have a choice you want this world, I will give it to you. And I will let you go and you will get whatever honorarium or, or whatever allotment you wanted, you will get it. But if you choose Allah and His Messenger, then Allah has prepared for you a massive reward. You make the choice. And when this verse came down, the Prophet went to every single wife, beginning with Aisha. And he said to Aisha, O oh, Aisha, Allah has revealed a verse. I'm going to recite it to you, but do not be hasty. And go talk to your parents before you make up your mind. Because our Prophet ﷺ, uh, might have felt that maybe Aisha in her haste would make a, a quick decision that she would later regret. So he said to her, don't be hasty. If you need to go to Abu Bakr, if you need to go to your mother and father, go to them. Don't make up your mind immediately. Then he recited this verse. Then Aisha said that, do you want me to go to my parents to ask whether I should stay or not? I don't need to ask them. Of course, I have chosen Allah and His Messenger. And all of the wives of the Prophet also chose to stay in the marriage, which means that basically this ayah is very important. Whoever chooses Allah and the Messenger and the hereafter, then Allah has prepared for the righteous amongst you a massive reward. O wives of the Prophet, the verses go on, whoever commits amongst you a indecency, then for her the punishment will be double, and Allah is easy to be able to do that. But whoever amongst you is devout and worships Allah and does good deeds, 
she shall get her reward double. And we shall have prepared for her a very noble abode. So once again, we have in the first verse a massive reward. Now in this verse, a double reward. Now, verse number 32. Ya Nisa an nabiyyi O wise of the Prophet, لَسْتُنَّكَ أَحَدٍ مِّنَ nisa You are not like any other lady. This is the most explicit verse. Our mothers are not like any other lady. O wives of the Prophet, you are not like any other lady. If you truly fear Allah, then do not be soft in your speech when you talk to uh, other men, just in case somebody who has a disease in this heart might uh, find something and speak in appropriate speech. And stay in your houses. And do not display yourselves like the people or the women of Jahiliyyah would display themselves. And establish the salah and give the zakah and obey Allah and His Messenger. Verily, Allah wants to purify you from all filth, O people of the house, and to cleanse you a pure cleansing. Then Allah says to them, And remember, وَذْكُرْنَ مَا يُتْلَى فِي بُيُوتِكُنَّ What has been recited in your own houses, meaning the house of the Prophet wasallam, of the verses of Allah and of His wisdom. Verily, Allah is Latif and Allah is Khabir. And then verse number 35 is very interesting. We have heard this verse many times. We don't, many of us understand or realize that it has occurred after Allah has talked about the believing mothers. And in this verse, it is the maximum number of male-female nouns in the whole Qur'an. No other verse has as many male and female nouns. إِنَّ الْمُسْلِمِينَ وَالْمُسْلِمَاتِ وَالْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ وَالْقَانِتِينَ وَالْقَانِتَاتِ وَالصَّادِقِينَ وَالصَّادِقَاتِ وَالصَّابِرِينَ وَالصَّابِرَاتِ وَالْخَاشِعِينَ وَالْخَاشِعَاتِ وَالْمُتَصَدِّقِينَ وَالْمُتَصَدِّقَاتِ وَالصَّائِمِينَ وَالصَّائِمَاتِ وَالْحَافِظِينَ فُرُوجَ وَالْحَافِظَاتِ وَالذَّاكِرِينَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا وَالذَّاكِرَاتِ أَعَدَّ اللَّهُ لَهُ مَغْفِرَةً وَأَجْرًا عَظِيمًا The believing men and women, the Muslim men and women, the obedient men and women, the truthful men and women, the patient men and women, the humble men and women, the charitable men and women, the fasting men and women, the guarding of their chastity men and women, the ones doing dhikr men and women, all of these eight, nine categories are mentioned, men and women, men and women, all of them, Allah has prepared for them a massive reward. Now, why did this verse come after the verse describing the wives of the Prophet Wasallam? Because it is very clear that they are being made the role model for women. There are no women better than them. And then Allah describes all of these adjectives and nouns, the believing men, the Muslim men, the obedient men and women, and so on and so forth. So, all of these verses indicate some of the blessings of the, of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. And what we learn from this is that these women, our mothers, are the role models for femininity. And they are the role models for virtuous ladies. Now, the question that arises, Allah says in the Quran, وَأَزْوَاجُهُ أُمَّهَاتُهُمْ that The Prophet is closer to the believing men than they themselves are, and his wives are their mothers. Trivial question, even though it has been discussed in the past. The mothers are the wives of the believing men. How about the believing women? Because the Quran mentions believing men. So the mothers of the, of the Prophet are, sorry, the wives of the Prophet are the mothers of the believing men. Are they also the mothers of the believing women? It is authentically reported that a lady visited Aisha radiallahu anha. A lady visited Aisha. And she said, Ya Ummah, my dear mother. And Aisha said, I am not your mother. I am only the mother to the men. I am your sister. So Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, I am not your mother. I am your sister. However, and so because of this, a few scholars of the past actually said that the mothers of the believers are only for the men. They are not the mothers of the believing women because of Aisha's statement. She herself said to a lady, I'm not your mother, I'm your sister. However, it appears that she said this out of modesty. Umm Salama, another wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she explicitly said, 
I am the mother of both the men and women amongst you. And most likely she said this when this phrase of Aisha spread amongst the people. So then she's clarifying that I am the mother of both men and women. And Al-Qurtubi comments on this narration. And he says, there doesn't seem to be any sense to restrict the motherhood to only the men and not to the women. How can the mothers be to the men and not to the women? And Ibn Hajar himself commented on this controversy and he said, the correct opinion, they are the mothers of the mu'mineen and the mothers of the mu'minat. And that's obvious, okay? So how do we understand Aisha's statement? Out of modesty. When a lady comes and says, my dear mother, and Aisha says, I'm just your sister. She's just being modest here. I'm your sister in Islam. She's trying to be modest. In reality, they are our mothers, believing men and believing women. Okay, now, another question that arises. If the wives of the Prophet Wasallam are called our mothers, what does that make the Prophet Wasallam? The title wise. Father. Should we or can we call the Prophet Wasallam our father? You say no, why? But why? The ayah in Surah An-Nisa says what? So, you're talking about مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِنْ رِجَالِكُمْ The Prophet or Muhammad Sassim is not the father of any of your men. Okay? Jayyid. In reality, the majority position is the opposite of what you have just said. A minority said that he should not be called the father based on this verse. But the verse doesn't negate calling him a father to the believers. The verse says he shall never be the father of any of your men means he's not going to have biological sons that will grow up to be adult men. And in fact, Ibn Taymiyyah writes, if he were not like a father to the believers, then his wives would not be called our mothers. The fact that his wives are called our mothers indicates that he has a fatherly status to us. And there are in fact, now this leads to a very deep question in all of my eight, nine years here, I've never talked about this issue uh, of the shad qiraat in a lot of detail because it raises a lot of confusions. Uh, there's something called shad qiraat and, and the qiraat of the Quran, uh, there are many authentic qiraat. Sometimes we have our qari who leads us, he recites other qiraat of the Quran. Uh, there are seven or ten that are mutawatir and then there are those that are beyond the mutawatir. They are called shad. And shad qiraat is a very, very deep, controversial topic. The average Muslim has never heard of them. Um, for, suffice to say for now that either these are tafsirs of the Sahaba or they are Quran that has been revealed in early Islam and then abrogated in later Islam. These are two opinions and there are other opinions that we shall not mention. So these are two opinions about Shad Qiraat. That Shad Qiraat are either tafsir of the Sahaba and they would say it as tafsir. And that's not a position that I find myself uh, very sympathetic to. And another position is that they were Quran at one point in time. Because the Quran has abrogation, as you know. And there's other opinions as well that we're not going to go into. Now, why am I talking about Shad Qiraat? Because in the Qira'a of Ubay ibn Ka'b and ibn Abbas and many of the early Tabi'een, in fact, this verse used to be recited that وَأَزْوَاجُهُ أُمَّهَاتُهُمْ وَهُوَ أَبٌ لَهُمْ وَهُوَ أَبٌ لَهُمْ This is a shad qira'a authentically narrated from Ibn Abbas. So the shad qira'a as we said, however you want to understand it, it is there. And it was recited at one point in time. And Ibn Abbas would and also obey uh, uh, Ibn Ka'b and others, they would recite literally that 
وَأَزْوَاجُهُ أُمَّهَاتُهُمْ وَهُوَ أَبٌ لَهُمْ And he is their father. So this Shaath Qira'a also shows us that we can consider the Prophet to be a father figure, like we consider his wives to be mother figures. Likewise, it is mentioned in the hadith of Abu Dawood, uh, in the book of Tahara, that the Prophet said, إِنَّمَا أَنَا لَكُمْ بِمَنْزِلَةِ الْوَالِدِي my position amongst you is like that of a father. I teach you like a father does. Then the hadith goes on. When one of you go to the restroom, wash yourself, etc., etc. The point is the process of saying, just like a father teaches his children these awkward facts of life, my position amongst you is that of the walid. And this is a hadith. So even if the shahid khira is not understandable, you have a hadith over here. My manzila is the manzila of the walid. And Mujahid, the famous student Ibn Abbas said, Kullu Nabi, every Nabi is like a, a walid for his qawm. Every Nabi is like a father for his qawm. Therefore, therefore, it is permissible to say that the Prophet ﷺ is a father of the believers. There's nothing wrong with that. So authentically in the Shahid Khira'ah, and authentic in the Sunnah, and authentic in the statements of the Sahaba and Tabi'een. Okay, so there's no problem. And also the fact that his mothers are our, his wives are our mothers, what does that mean? It means automatically that he is a father figure to us. Jayyid, okay. Next question. Now that I've answered this one, the next one will be much easier for you. Will the brothers of our mothers be called uncles? Uncles of the believers. And will their sisters be called aunts of the believers? And in Arabic, the mother's brother is called Khal. And the mother's sister is called Khala. No, not Am. Am is the other side. Am is the father's side. The Khal, the Khal, unlike our Urdu Khalu, no, nothing like that, okay? We, with that, we call them Mamu or whatever, right? Yeah. In, Arab, in, in, in Arabic, Khal is the mother's brother. Okay. So, does this mean, therefore, then, that the brothers of his wives and the sisters of his wives are Khal and Khalat of the Mu'minin and Mu'minats? Well, is the Ummah biological? Jayid, so uh, the, 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 uh, the point that is being made is that we shouldn't extend this analogy. The mother is the mother. Let's not take it too far. This might be a theory, but in reality, the ummah didn't go that route. And it was very common for the brothers and sisters, to the, the brothers in particular, to take on the term uh, akhwal or akhal. Uh, and obviously this is not the biological one because obviously the brothers and sisters of the wives of the Prophet they married other people. It's not as if they became haram like the mothers became haram, obviously, right? So uh, Aisha's sister is who? Asma and Asma married Zubair, right? And others as well, you know, Abbas married Umm al-Fadl and she's the sister of Maymuna. So obviously the brothers and sisters didn't become haram for the rest of the ummah, obviously. However, if they are our mothers, then their brothers can be called khal out of respect and not out of any other, as we said, biological or whatnot. And this was the case in particular for one person. In particular, one person banked in on being the khal more than anybody else. Who? Muawiyah radiallahu anhu. Muawiyah was the one person who definitely took advantage of that relationship and he would call himself khalul mu'mineen i am the uncle of the mu'mineen because muawiyah's sister umm habiba binti binti abi sufyan right so and uh, it is something that uh, he would acknowledge and he would take as this title and it's not just him i mean therefore if if muawiyah is the khal then ibn umar is also the khal 
right? Because he is the brother of Hafsa. In any case, uh, Ibn Kathir writes, this title is just used as an expression and it's not to affirm an actual relationship. And Ibn Taymiyyah writes, meaning Khal and Khala. Ibn Taymiyyah writes, those who use this title only intended to honor the fact that these people were in-laws of the Prophet ﷺ. That's it. It's nothing, no other relationship is established. Not even necessarily a higher privilege or relationship. It's just that, okay, these were the in-laws of the Prophet wasallam, so we can call him Khal or Khala. Now, Allah says in the Quran, وَأَزْوَاجُهُ أُمَّهَاتُهُمْ وَأَزْوَاجُهُ أُمَّهَاتُهُمْ Therefore, this means that those who were milk yameen are not ummahat. Those who are of the right hand possessions are not ummahat and they don't have the blessings given to the ummahat by unanimous consensus of the ulama of Islam. And Maria al Qibtiya is the primary example, and there are other examples as well. We do not call Maria our mother. She doesn't have the title of the mother of the believers because she was not of the zawjat. So only the azwaj have the status of mother. And therefore also the same rules that applied to the ummahat did not apply to them. So for example, the extra strict hijab that our mothers had, they had an extra hijab on them uh, that even their bodies could not be seen. So they had to and they... so. Uh, an average lady, if she wears hijab, she may be seen. The mothers of the believers, she could, they could not be seen. Hence, when Aisha was on the battle of the camel, she was in a haudaj. She was in a complete sequestered tent on top of the camel. Otherwise, it's not necessary for, for, for women to, to do that uh, uh, in Islam. And when the incident of Khaybar takes place, the, the Safiya marriage takes place, the, the, the Sahaba were debating, is Safiya a milk yameen or is she a wife? And they said, let us see. If he covers her, then she is our mother. And if he doesn't, she is milk yameen. So when Safiya came out of the tent, she was covered. And so they knew that Safiya was a mother of the believers. So the extra rulings that apply to the mothers do not apply to uh, 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 the, the, the milk yameen. Now, going over all of these verses, uh, what are some... and, and, and things that we've said in the last class. What are some of the blessings given to the mothers of the believers? And this should all be a repeat, so I'll be, be, do it very quickly. Number one of the blessings of the mothers of the believers. Number one, the Prophet wasallam chose them, hence Allah chose them for his Prophet. As Allah says in the Quran, Righteous men belong to righteous women, and righteous women belong to righteous men. And there is no one who is more righteous than the Prophet ﷺ. So automatically, he being the most righteous, his wives become the most righteous women. As well, he chose all of them, meaning none of his marriage were blind arranged marriages in the traditional sense that many of our cultures did. Every one of his marriages, without exception, he was the one who chose and he was the one who initiated except for Khadija where after a little bit of initiation the both of them agreed. There was no arranged marriage. He was the one who chose them. Therefore, by his choosing of them, this means literally they were chosen by the Prophet wasallam, and their choosing automatically means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen for the Prophet wasallam. Therefore, number two, we call them our mothers. Number three, Allah says, you are not like other women. Number four, marriage becomes haram for them until they die. After the process, they can never get married. Number five, Allah says they get double reward. Uh, Allah says you get the double reward. And in the other verse, you will get ajran azima. Number six, they are included in our salawat every time we say salah Ibrahimiyyah. And that is a massive blessing. Every single Muslim who says, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad, we are making dua for our mothers. And this is proven in the hadith in Sahih Bukhari. In another version of the Salah Ibrahimiyya, the Prophet taught, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala azwaji Muhammad wa ala dhurriyati Muhammad. So, when we say, Allahumma salli ala ali Muhammad, we mean azwaj and dhurriyya by explicit text of the Qur'an. And this is a major blessing. Number seven, of the specialities and blessings, they cannot accept sadaqah. Number eight, as Allah says in the Qur'an, whoever chooses Allah, Allah Azza wa Jal will give them darul akhirah. 
and all of them chose Allah and His Messenger. So all of them chose Allah. So by explicit text of the Quran, they shall get Jannah. This is explicit in the Quran. Number nine, again we quoted the verse. Allah says to them, remain in your houses and He commands them to spread knowledge. Whatever was recited in your houses of the Quran and of wisdom, you need to remind the people about that. And as we shall discuss, many of our mothers, they are the primary narrators of hadith, especially a hadith about our uh, Prophet Sallallahu you know, taking ghusl and other things that nobody else will narrate other than him. And number 10 of their greatest blessings is that they shall be the eternal companions and wives of the Prophet Sallallahu in Jannah. So they are not just his wives in this world, they are his wives in Jannah for all and all and all and all of eternity. What greater blessing can that be? That they shall be with the Prophet Sallallahu in the palaces of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, 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 for all of eternity beyond what the mind can imagine. And this is something, again, explicit, that they shall be his wives in Jannah. Uh, for example, uh, the hadith in Abu Dawood, when the Prophet ﷺ divorced Hafsa, one divorce, Jibreel came to him and said, O Muhammad ﷺ, take her back, for she is your wife in Jannah. She is your wife in Jannah. So Jibreel is saying, you can't let her go. She is going to be your wife in Jannah. And that is why they have been prohibited from marrying after him, according to one opinion. One opinion says this is why they have been prohibited. And this is based on nothing explicit. A statement of Hudayfa, Hudayfa the companion. Hudayfa the companion said to his wife as he was about to die, very romantic, sisters don't blame me, this is what he said. Okay, He said to his wife, my dear wife, if you wish to be with me in Jannah, then don't marry after me. Because a woman shall be with the last husband of hers in this world. Okay? So he said to his wife on his deathbed, You have a choice. If you want to marry, go ahead. But if you want to be with me, then don't marry after me. Okay? Now, this is a fiqh issue, a theological issue. Again, uh, jokes aside, there's nothing explicit in the Quran or Sunnah that if a lady has had multiple husbands, which one will she be with in Jannah? Will it be with the last one or will it be with the one she decides? That's supposing they all make it to Jannah. That's a technicality that we're not going to uh, discuss in this uh, issue. But it is true, mo most scholars say that the logical um, possibility that comes to mind, she should be with the one whose nikah was valid when she died. It makes sense. It's just a logical thing. You know, that the last marriage, that when the nikah was valid, and she, just like our place in Jannah is decided upon where we are when we die, right? Our ikhlas, our yaqeen, our tawakkul. So too, they say, the last marriage, right? So marry wisely and divorce wisely, right? Anyway, jokes aside there, inshallah, before I get into more trouble here. It's Hudayfa's opinion. There's no Quran and Sunnah for this. But according to this, we can use this to prove that they will be his wives in Jannah. And we don't need this technicality because we have the hadith of uh, Abu Dawood where the Prophet where Jibreel said, she is your wife in Jannah. And also hadith in Sahih Bukhari as well, an athar, where Ammar ibn Yasir, when he was talking about our mother Aisha in the battle of the Jamal, in the battle of the camel, and he was sent to negotiate. And remember what happened, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. He said, Ammar ibn Yasir said, I know that she is his wife in this world and in the next. But, and then she went, we disagree with her, even if she is our mother and she is our mother and she is his wife in this world and in the next. So he affirmed the continuity, obviously, of the marital relationship in the next um, life. And Ibn Hazm and other great scholars mentioned this explicitly that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised them Darul Akhira, which he did in the Quran, then which palace will they be in? The palace of the Prophet. And therefore, uh, because a person is with his family, the Quran says, right, Hum wa and the Prophet said, a man is with whom, those whom he loves. So it is common sense, and to be honest, we don't even need to prove it in all of these ways, but our scholars have proven it, that it makes sense as well. So our mothers are not just his wives in this world, they are his wives in the Akhirah as well. Okay, next point. Are, are our mothers of a higher status than the ten promised Jannah, or are the ten, like Abu Bakr and Umar, better than them? Okay. Uh, 
in this issue, in this question, Ibn Hazm, uh, out of all of the scholars, he seems to be the strongest champion of the status of the mothers of the believers. He is their, mashallah, yani defense lawyer, whatever. He always wants to give them. He has the most praise for the mother of the believers than pretty much any scholar. And he claims, and it's a logical claim, as we just said this 10 seconds ago, which palace will the mothers be in? The prophets. And where will that palace be? Where in Jannah? Where in Firdaus? Under the Arsh. So then what does that make them vis-a-vis -vis the other Sahaba? So he uses this theological argument to say that the wives of the Prophet are better than all of the other men. Right? And by the way, Ibn Hazm has many positions that some of our more feminist inclined sisters love. This is one of them. Okay? In all of Islamic history, he has positions that are interesting. And this is one of them. However, pretty much the vast majority of scholars, they, including uh, uh, Subki, he has a, a long passage on this as well. Uh, and, Ibn, uh, and many other scholars, they mentioned that, look, the, the issue of the Ashra Mubashara, the blessings of Abu Bakr, of Umar, of all of these others, they are explicit and very, very particular. And there is no comparison in that overall the ten promised Jannah, and in particular Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali and the ones that the Prophet spoke about, they in fact are, are, have a higher place in, uh, not necessarily in Jannah, but they are more, they have a higher rank in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the point here is that, and there's an interesting point, uh, which is true as well, the fact that two spouses are together in Jannah does not necessarily mean that they have the same rank in the eyes of Allah. Because in the end of the day, you will have, I mean, it, will, it is impossible almost for two people to be spiritually at the exact same level, married to each other, and earn the same level of Jannah. Yet they will be together in Jannah. So the rank in the eyes of Allah does not necessarily translate at all times as your rank in Jannah. You can, and what, what I mean by this is, you can be with somebody of a higher rank or a lower rank, and the blessings you have are according to your rank. And you don't know because Allah Azza wa Jal has the power to do that, but you will be physically with them, but the rank is something else. So the point being that even in this world, subhanAllah, it's possible that you can be, uh, even two couples might overall be happy, but one of them is happier than the other. Isn't that the case? Okay. Life is more content for them than the other, for example. You can be living together and one is enjoying life better because of whatever factors. If we can understand it in this world, then how much more so in the Akhirah? The point being that just because they are going to be with the Prophet doesn't mean that Abu Bakr and others do not have a higher rank in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this does seem to be the case and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Okay, how about, this is about the other men Sahaba. How about... Uh, the four whom the Prophet ﷺ said perfected their iman, the, pro uh, the four ladies. The Prophet ﷺ said, many amongst men have perfected their iman, but only four amongst women have perfected their iman. Who are the four? Everybody should know. Number one, Maryam. Number two, number two, that's three. Number two, Asiya. Number three, Khadija. Number four, Fatima. Okay, so other than Khadija, who's number three, uh, so that's obviously she's in the list. How about the other wives? How do they compete with these four? Once again, Ibn Hazm is in the camp of the mothers of the believers. And he says, other than Maryam, basically all the wives of the process are basically the rank of Khadija. Automatically, they just get that high uh, rank and they are the best of the um, best. Um, however, uh, most of the other scholars said, that this hadith indicates that these four have the highest rank of women and the mothers are a rank below them. The very fact that the Prophet said, and one of our mothers is in the list, and that's Khadija. And this clearly indicates, therefore, that the rest are not on the list or else he would have mentioned them. Okay, so Khadija has that status and the other mothers are of a rank that still is very, very high, but not of that uh, status. Okay, 
and by the way, all of these questions are of a theoretical nature. In the end of the day, it doesn't make much difference to us. But it's just preliminaries before we get to the stories. These are all preliminaries that need to be done. Okay, how about the mothers of the believers versus uh, the daughters and in particular Fatima radiallahu anha? How about the comparison or the mufadala over there? The majority position is that Fatima is more beloved than the mothers other than Khadija. Because Khadija and Fatima are mentioned together. So the vast majority say that Fatima has a rank higher than the mothers other than her own mother. You understand what I'm saying? Between Fatima and Khadija, which of the two? They're both in the list. Majority say Fatima here. And again, these are all opinions. In the end of the day, Allah knows and it doesn't matter to us. In the end of the day, they say Fatima has a higher ranking. And one of the reasons being that the love that the Prophet had for uh, Fatima, uh, obviously, yani the, 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 as every mother and father knows, the love for the child is, there's no compare, does it, it's its own category, its own category uh, of that. And uh, the, the, the care and concern that he had for Fatima. Uh, in the end of the day, as I said, these are all theoretical um, issues. Okay, how about Khadija versus Aisha? And again, all of this is theoretical. At the end of the day, they're both in Firdaus al A'la. It's just a theoretical. It's splitting hairs, as they say. That's why, I'm, by the way, I'm zooming over this because, frankly, I, Allah knows I could have had three lectures just on these various issues. Who cares in the end of the day? They are all in Jannah al Firdaus, and it's so trivial. Who is more? But some of the times our scholars, they just want to discuss these things so, so that you know as well. So I'm just quickly going over it. How about between Aisha and Khadija? There's unanimous consensus here. Khadija, why do you say this? Why, why so easily? She made the list. Very good. Okay, and? So she used to be jealous. Well, the brother mentioned used that Aisha used to be jealous of, of uh, Khadija. And... Uh, this is the vast majority position that Khadija is uh, the best of the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One of the early scholars, Abu Bakr ibn Dawood, was asked, who is better, Khadija or Aisha? And he said, this is a beautiful point, I like this. He said, Jibreel came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam while he was with Aisha and he gave Aisha salam. And Allah sent Jibreel to Khadija's house to give Allah's salam to Khadija. Big difference. And this is a very valid point because both of these hadith are authentic. And there is a hadith as well which we will come to when we talk about Khadija. Uh, there is a hadith as well that one day Aisha got angry uh, because she sensed the love that the Prophet had for Khadija. And she angrily said, for how long will you continue to mention an old hag from the Quraysh whose cheeks have gone down and who's toothless? So she used some negative adjectives. She had never seen Khadija, but she's just using these adjectives. And Allah has blessed you with someone better than her. She said, I never saw the Prophet get that angry unless it was for the sake of Allah. That that angry he got there. And he said, no, Allah did not give me better than her. And then he described the blessings of Khadija. She believed in me when nobody believed in me. And she supported me when nobody supported me. And she gave me her money when nobody gave me money. And she gave me children when uh, none of you have given me children. So Aisha said after that, I never spoke of Khadija again. But the key phrase is what? No, Allah has not given me better than her. This is pretty explicit that, that uh, Khadija is better. Believe it or not, one group of scholars said, no, Aisha is better. And they based it on one hadith, which is in Bukhari, that the blessings of Aisha over all the other women are like the blessings of Tharid over all other food. What is Tharid? Tharid was their equivalent of biryani. You laugh, I am serious. Tharid was their equivalent of biryani, literally. What is biryani? <laughs> I'm getting definition of biryani. Huh? <laughs> it is the combination of our staple uh, you know, uh, uh, food item, our staple protein with our staple, basically, uh, uh, starch item, right? So 
Sarid was their equivalent, literally. It's a mixture of their bread with their meat. Okay, they didn't have rice. As you all know, I've said a million times, the Prophet never ate rice in his life. But they had a type of bread, and they had obviously meat, and they had a broth that they would cook and combine, and it was their elite dish that they would cook when they only had the wealth and the you know, the, 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 the one and occasion. So he said, the superiority of Aisha over all other women is like that of Tharid, which is their best dish over all other dishes, right? So this hadith seems to indicate who has the best, Aisha. But it is responded to that, in fact, in some versions, this hadith is tacked on at the end of the four women hadith. Four women have perfected their iman, da, da 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 and the blessings of Aisha over other women. So it is as if Aisha is being given some blessings, but not to the level of these four. Ibn Taymiyyah has an interesting take on all of this, and Ibn Taymiyyah says that we should not compare the two, and each one is blessed in a special manner unique to her. So Khadija was the blessed of early Islam. Aisha was the blessed of later Islam. Each one supported and was beloved in their own ways. And Ibn Taymiyyah and others mention, let us not forget that when the man came to the Prophet and said, O Messenger of Allah, who do you love the most? Instantaneously he said, Aisha. Amongst the men I meant her father. And this is a public testimony of the love of Aisha in the, wife of the, uh, in the life of the Prophet wasallam. Also let us not forget that Allah Azza wa Jal chose to take our Prophet's life when he was in the house of Aisha, on the chest of Aisha, literally being hugged by Aisha, and the saliva of Aisha was in his mouth because of the miswak. This is not a trivial matter, that the love that was there is also clearly shown. So, in the end of the day, Ibn Taymiyyah has a valid point, yet I still say that the hadith of the four and tharid clearly indicates that overall, Khadija has a, a superiority over Aisha. And yet what Ibn Taymiyyah says is true, that in later Islam, there is only Aisha in that level. But that doesn't compare to what happened in early Islam. So that's the issue of the blessings and the fadila and whatnot. Jayid. Now, how many mothers do we have? We will discuss this question in a lot more detail than today. But to begin and jumpstart the discussion, the agreed upon number concerning which there's no difference of opinion is 11. Two of whom passed away in his lifetime and so he was married to nine uh, at the time of his death. This is the agreed upon number. You don't have to write these names down. We're going to go over them one by one in the next weeks, inshallah ta'ala. Khadija binti Khuwailid, Sauda binti Zumu'a, Aisha binti Abi Bakr, Hafsa binti Umar, Zainab binti Khuzayma, Umm Salama Hind binti Abi Umayya, Zainab binti Jahsh, Juwayriya binti Al-Harith, Umm Habiba Ramla binti Abi Sufyan, Safiya binti Huyay, and Maymuna binti Al-Harith. These are the 11 in the order that he got married to them. Six of them were from the Quraysh. The ones who are not from the Quraysh, Zainab bin Tijahsh, his cousin from his puppy, from his mother's side, from his father's mother. Zainab bin Tijahsh, his cousin, was not from the Quraysh because Zainab's father was from the Banu Asad. Zainab bin Tijahsh, so both Zainab, she was married to two Zainabs. Both Zainabs were non Qurayshi. Zainab bin Tijahsh was from another, another Arab tribe called Qais al Ailan. Maymuna uh, was from the Banu Hilal. And Juwaydiya was from the Banu Khuza'a. Okay? These four were from the non Qurayshi Arab tribe. So six from the Quraysh, four from the non Quraysh, that leaves how many? One. What's the one who's left? Who's non Arab? One was non Arab, and that is Safiya. Okay? Non Arab meaning by Arab here, I mean of the children of Adnan and Qahtan. She was from another ethnically. Obviously, she spoke Arabic, obviously, but she was not Arab by lineage. So, Ten of his wives were Arab, six were Qurashi, four were non Qurashi, and one was non Arab. And these eleven were agreed upon, as we said, and he died while he was married to nine of them. Uh, the two that died in his lifetime are obviously Khadija, and the second one is Maimuna. Maimuna passed, sorry, not Maimuna, sorry. Uh, uh, not Maimuna, sorry. Uh, Zainab. Zainab. 
uh, no, I myself am forgetting, subhanAllah. Not to, yes, it is Maymuna. I'm getting I'm forgetting myself, subhanAllah. Uh, it is Maymuna. I will confirm with you my memory is now gone blank now. And the problem comes is puts on YouTube, automatically people give comments because they now have the luxury of looking it up. Uh, but two of them died in his lifetime. Uh, I think it is Maymuna. And of course Khadija is the first one that passed away. And when he passed away, there were nine that uh, he was married to. Jayid. I said these are the ones there's no difference of opinion. Now we get to the issue where many of you have never heard of these issues, so we're going to have to start them. There are many instances and women regarding which there is a difference of opinion. Okay? And because what we know about these is usually one paragraph or two at max, generally speaking, the books of seerah that you guys read don't even mention them. You only find them in the classical, in the source books, in the original sources. Generally speaking, these names, especially in non-Arabic sources, Urdu and English and whatnot, very rarely do the authors writing for uh, you know, um, uh, you know, the Muslims like, uh, of the masses, they never get involved in this because why should they? And I don't see any problem as well in them for not to do that. However, as you all know, I'm not talking about a very basic level. I'm going to a very advanced level, and it wouldn't befit the series that we have done for the seerah, except that we spend the same amount of attention upon our mothers, upon the wives of the Prophet wasallam. So in reality, the, f the first category, those women whom he married, and there's no ikhtilaf regarding, these are the 11. There are five other categories, and we will discuss these categories one by one even if there's not that much information, but again, that's the point of us going that far. Number one, those women whom he married, nikah was done, but he didn't consummate the marriage for whatever reason. And there are quite a number in this category. For example, one of them, and these names I'm not going to mention now, we'll talk about them. This, we're, <laughs> you're in the right place for the series, inshallah. We're in driving the car, we're going to get there, inshallah, at some point in time. That's not going to be the immediate one. Immediately, we'll start with the 11. After we're done with the 11, then we're going to come back to these five categories. So remember, these are five categories. Number one, those whom he married, but the marriage was not consummated. And by the way, none of these five are our mothers. The mothers are the ones whom he married and consummation occurred. So five of them, number one, the nikah was not consummated. How could the nikah not be consummated? Number of things. First and foremost, sometimes, uh, believe it or not, there was an instance where he married a particular lady and she was sent to Medina by her tribe and family and she passed away on the way to Medina. Okay? She's not considered our mother. Okay? Uh, other cases, um, for example, the infamous one, the lady from the tribe of Joan. The lady from the tribe of Joan, um, uh, that uh, it is said that uh, when the Prophet entered in upon her, uh, she said, A'udhu billahi minka. Right? A'udhu billahi minka. Why she said this, we'll talk about later on. And he said, you have sought refuge in one who is indeed great. Okay, go to your family. So that's a divorce right there. And he sent her back. And there is the case as well of the lady who had a disease and she didn't tell the Prophet ﷺ a uh, skin disease and she did not tell the Prophet ﷺ. And so when on the night of the wedding, he saw the skin was disfigured and whatnot, he said, wear your clothes and go back to your family because as you know in the Sharia, ah, you tell of a personal fault of this nature, you don't hide it. And this was a type of deceit that uh, had taken place and it is not befitting that you know, uh, the Prophet is dealt with in this manner. So he said, wear your clothes and go to your family. So he sent her back also. And there are other cases as well. These women are not considered our mothers because the consummation did not take place. And there are others, we'll talk about them. Number two, those whom he proposed to, but for whatever reasons, they turned the proposal down. Can you believe there were such women? Yes, there were such women. He proposed, and they turned the proposal down. Foremost amongst them, the most famous case, and the story is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari. And again, that's just because we don't study the books of hadith, we don't know it. So when you hear it for the first time, you're like, what? How? No, it's there, well known. Multiple women. This is the most famous, was none other than Ummi Hani binti Abi Talib, the sister of Ali and Ja'far and Aqil, the daughter of Abu Talib, Ummi Hani. 
when the Prophet ﷺ conquered Mecca, she was without husband. And he proposed for her, to her. This is his cousin. He proposed to her, the daughter of Abu Talib. And of course, he had known her since childhood, being raised in the house of Abu Talib. And Umm Hani gave a beautiful response. Ya Rasulullah, you are more beloved to me than my eyes and my ears. And how can I possibly say no to you? However, I am a lady with five or six children, however many she had. And I am worried if I give the haq that you deserve, my children will not get their, their haq. And if I give my children their haq, give, give you your haq. So as a mother, she basically said, I would love to be married to you, but I have children and I know that what you deserve, I cannot give to my mother, uh, to my children. So the Prophet ﷺ then praised her and the women of Quraysh. And he said the famous hadith, the most loving and the most forbearing women are the women of Quraysh for their children. Uh, and he praised you know, them for this regard. So he proposed to Umm Hani, she doesn't become our mother. And there are other women as well. So that's the second category. The third category, those who wahabat nafsaha lin nabi. The Quran mentions Surah Ahzab, verse 52, right? This is a very, very important verse that uh, needs to be very quickly recited. That uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, in the, not 52, sorry, uh, 50, verse 50. O Prophet, we have made lawful for you your wives, whom you have given your mahr to, and your right hands, uh, that you, whatever your right hand possesses, and your, basically your cousins that have done hijrah with you. And a woman who has offered herself wahabat nafsaha to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, if the Prophet wants to marry her, and this is only for you, خالصت لك من دون المؤمنين, it is not allowed for any other believer. Okay, so this is a category, category number three. Those who offered themselves in marriage to the Prophet ﷺ. Now, very interestingly, how many of our mothers came from this category? How many of our mothers came through this category? No, this is before Islam anyway. That doesn't, and also this is different. Wahabat nafsaha, you don't need a, a wali. Whereas Khadija was married through the standard wali. It is said, we'll get to there. In reality, the correct opinion, none of them. None of them. Yet this verse exists in the Quran. Yet this verse exists in the Quran. So in reality, the verse shows the maqam of the Prophet system, and he never actually utilized it. Now, did women offer for marriage? Yes or no? Yes. Multiple times. Not just once. The famous hadith of Sahih Bukhari is in Sahih Bukhari where a woman came and said, Ya Rasulullah, I offer myself to you in marriage. And the narration says he raised his eyes and looked at her and looked at her the way that a man would look and then he put his eyes down and didn't say anything. And she realized that this was a no. In his akhlaq he didn't say, he didn't say no, but it's understood. And then after a while, you know, another man said, Ya Rasulullah, if you don't want to marry her, can I marry her? And the woman was there and she's quietly approving as well. So the Prophet said, what do you have of mahar? He said, I don't have anything. He said, go to your family, meaning your tribe, and see what you have. Even if you find a ring of uh, uh, hadith, of, of just anything, find something. He goes back, he goes, Ya Rasulullah, I don't even have a ring. So he said, what do you have of the Quran? He said, I have surah this, surah this, surah this, surah this. So he said, okay, I give you her in marriage if you teach her these surahs of the Quran. So the mahar became uh, surahs of the Quran. But the point is that she came and she offered herself to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the hadith in Bukhari as well, that Aisha said, this is from Aisha. She said, I used to have ghira. Ghira is a type of jealousy that women and men have for uh, their loved ones. It's, a, it's halal as long as you keep it in check. And it become, can become haram if you do something haram. But it is halal and a level of ghira is a sign of iman. And a level of ghira is a sign of decency. If you don't have any ghira, then you have a problem in your heart. There should be a natural ghira, and sometimes ghira can, can, can lead you to sin as well. So there's levels. 
but a base level of ghira, like you feel a sense of, of, of personal protection and jealousy and honor with regards to your spouse. Okay? And as we said, a level is not just halal, not just wajib, it is natural. Even a non Muslim who has dignity will have ghira for his or her spouse. And if you don't have any karama and dignity, then you, as they say, let's not go down that path. Point is, Aisha said, I used to have ghira more than the other women uh, for the Prophet. And those ladies that would offer themselves to him, I would say, How can any woman do this? How can any woman do this? That offer herself to the Prophet. Then Allah revealed Surah Azab, verse 50. Then Allah revealed, after I said this, how can any woman do this? Then Allah revealed that you're allowed to marry anyone who offers herself. So I said to the Prophet ﷺ, Indeed, your Lord rushes to please you. <laughs> like anything. So even this her ghira. Even this her ghira. Like I said it and Allah revealed the Quran invalidating me. And this is... Okay, permissible here for Aisha. She has that right and rank and privilege to say this. Nobody else should say this. She gets away with it because she's Aisha and she can get away with it. Not everybody has the same level. The fact that she's Aisha and she loves the process of the way that a wife loves her husband and she is married to the process of she can get away with this. Otherwise, if somebody outside said this, it could be interpreted. But she has a genuine ghira and she says, your Lord is indeed racing to go please you. Uh, whatever you want, he will give to you. Uh, so this is category number three. These are obviously not our mothers. Category number four. Those who were offered to him by others, but he didn't accept. So people proposed their sisters or daughters or whatever, and they said, why don't you marry so-and-so? And he said no. And many examples are here. For example, Ali radiallahu anhu said, Ya Rasulullah, why do you not marry more women from the Quraysh? You're marrying these other ladies. We want you to marry amongst us. And the Prophet said, do you have anybody in mind? There are no ladies of the Quraysh I can marry. And he said, yes, uh, Umama binti Hamza, his cousin, Hamza's daughter. Uh, Umama was the orphan girl that grew up now. So Umama binti Hamza, you know, she's of marriageable age. Why don't you marry her? So he said, he replied, she is not allowed for me because... He, because you are sisters, you cannot have two sisters, right? So he's making an offering and other offers have been given as well. So this is category four. Category five, the last one is milk yameen, that is the sarari of the Prophet wasallam. And these are obviously not our mothers. And how many sarari he had is another big issue of controversy. For sure, at a bare minimum, there are four that are confirmed. There are four that are confirmed. Uh, most famous amongst them is Maria al Qibtiya, but there are three others, and we'll talk about them when we get there. They might even have been more. So, out of these, subhanAllah, some have made the number to be more than 30 ladies, but in reality, we are not interested in, by and large, those who offered themselves, those that were offered to Him. Uh, we're more interested in categories one, two, and five. Okay, those whom he married but didn't consummate, uh, and number two, those whom he proposed, because that shows he chose them, All right? And then they said no, and then the milk yameen. These are the ones that we are more interested in. Now, before we also conclude for today, uh, we have to rid ourselves of two false notions, and uh, the problem comes. I'm giving you this disclaimer now, and then as the lectures go on, we're going to get new people that are coming. Nothing can be done about that. That's the reality of having a long series of lectures. We have to rid ourselves of some false notions, and we're concluding with this. Firstly, this completely erroneous notion that the Prophet ﷺ never divorced or never gave khula, this is simply false. It is a myth that has no shred of legitimacy. He gave some women divorces. We already mentioned number one, those women he married but didn't consummate. Most of them, there were divorces given. And even some of them like Hafsa, he came, took the divorce back. So he did divorce Hafsa and then he took her back. So this false notion that he never divorced women, this is simply untrue. He did when there was a need to and we'll talk about that. Secondly, uh, as we will discuss some of these stories and some of these incidents, if someone has a perception of marriage and of desire that is different than reality, then there will be problematic reports. And we need to rid ourselves of the false perception that we have. There are other scholars and other books out there 
that have given brief lectures about the mothers of the believers. And the fact of the matter is, by and large, they have sanitized this chapter of the seerah. And they have cut things that might be awkward, and they have presented a version that might be suitable for the masses. Alhamdulillah, good. As you are all aware, listening to my seerah, that is not my methodology at all. It has been my firm belief that the truth is better than hiding it. That telling you the reality is going to save you in the long run rather than protect you from something. Then you hear it from an incorrect source and then you get genuine doubt. And this has been my methodology for the entire seven years of the seerah. And the feedback that I've gotten in the last 10 years since I've been teaching and nine years I've been teaching it has confirmed beyond a shadow of the doubt that my methodology was right inshallah in this regard. That in the time that we live in, we cannot hide facts. Maybe a hundred years ago, it would have been beneficial. And that's why majority of the lectures you will hear about the wives of the Prophet they are sanitized, romanticized, cut, so that you find a very, very a version that we, we would like to, to basically in our minds here. But when you get to the reality, there are things that are not as clean for our minds. Meaning, they present a reality that is different from the ones we have constructed in our minds. And there are awkward stories if we have an incorrect attitude. If we have a correct attitude, no story is awkward. If we understand reality, then no story is awkward. And in the seerah itself, to this day, and I said this last month when we had uh, Ustad Abdul Nasser with us, when you guys asked what is the most difficult story of the seerah to present, I said it was the story really of uh, Zainab uh, bint Jahsh. It really was the most difficult because I know how people are and I know how easy it is for emotional people to really blame you rather than the books that you got it from because their version of events is, is, is different. And another very difficult story for me was the story of Maria. I mean, how do you really explain to an average Muslim who's never studied the seerah, the story of the Maria, uh, uh, Maria Qibtiya? To this day, many of our sisters say, wait, 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 what was Maria? They don't even understand. You know, it's like they're just living in a different paradigm. So to be very brutally honest, we need to rid ourselves of this notion that religiosity and taqwa and iman somehow gets rid of natural attack, attraction between men and women. Romance and intimacy and sexuality are a natural part of being a human, just like enjoying good food. And here's the irony. No one, at, at least in this audience by and large, has any problem when they hear that the Prophet loved a shank of lamb. Is that problematic to anybody, right? Well, to the vegetarian progressives, it is problematic. But I mean, you know, by and large, I mean, we understand. He loved, even though it's luxury item, right? We all understand, like, human being is a human being. And if he presented a shank of, if he were presented a choice, he would choose the shank of lamb. It's a luxury food item. So the notion that if you're religious, somehow you become an angel in your desires is simply not true. I did the story of Yusuf. وَلَقَدْ هَمَّتْ بِهِ وَهَمَّ بِهَا And I explained that story according to the very clear language. And there is no need to go jump around. She desired him, he desired her. But he saw Allah's test. There's nothing irreligious about having a legitimate, natural attraction as long as it is not acted upon. And this notion that if you're religious you won't get permissible desires or you won't want permissible relationships. This notion is not coming from Islam. This is another interesting point. It's a tangent, but it needs to be said. Where does this notion come from that considers sex and sexuality and romance to be evil? It actually comes from ancient Christianity, from medieval notions of Christianity. It comes from the uh, Victorian era. Uh, there were, there were ancient Christians' origin. One of the, uh, one of the ancient Christian fathers died, 254. Um, he claimed that the serpent who had seduced Eve seduced her sexually. So he began this notion that all sexual activity must inherently be evil. The main person that is blamed for this is St. Augustine. Again, 300, 400, 400 CE, way before Islam, 20 years before Islam. St. Augustine, by the way, he has been diagnosed in modern times as basically being a borderline psychotic. He was a, a sexual pervert, a deviant in so many ways. And he felt, believe it or not, that even married couples should view sex as a necessary evil. 
Like even married couples should have this negative attitude towards romance. And they should do it grudgingly. They should do it without any enjoyment. To enjoy it within marriage, we're talking about, is a sin in the eyes of God. Now, this is something that we do not find even a whiff of in our Islamic tradition. That's why when Allah describes Jannah with Hurun Ain, it's only modern Muslims who find it problematic, right? Classical medieval Muslims never had a problem with this whatsoever. Later Christianity, medieval Christianity, and especially Victorian era, you know, Europe, they had these views on sexuality that actually shaped, believe it or not, our own modern views, us, the Muslim world as well. And we have these notions of religious folks not having any desires. Well, we see what happens in, you know, when they try to do that in their church. We see what happens. doesn't work that way. Believe it or not, Christianity at some points in time even forbade couples from engaging in intimacy five days of the week. Believe it or not. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, it was haram. Only Tuesday, Wednesday, you had, you know, two days. I'm sure they're looking forward to Tuesdays if you're practicing Catholic of those time frames. So, and even then, by the way, even Tuesday, Wednesday, if it was Lent or season, even then it's not allowed. I mean, they have very weird views. And Victorian times came and cemented these. And they had this notion that enjoying sex is somehow backward or not enjoyed by enlightened people. And romance should not be done. Well, frankly, these notions have no basis in the Quran and Sunnah whatsoever. And they fly in the face of experienced reality. Which is why, by the way, again, all of this is tangent. I didn't talk, intend to talk 15, 10 minutes about this. But the whole sexual liberation movement of the 70s, it is a reaction to Christianity and to Victorian times. When you stifle and you stifle and you stifle, what's gonna happen? This, what we see now, a fahisha, it is because they didn't embrace regular sexuality. When you're gonna make everything haram and forbidden and whatnot, well then when the floodgates open, khalas, now we have to deal with this reality. So my point is, let's go back to what I'm talking about. We're gonna embark on a segment of the seerah that deals with marriage. And we have to acknowledge from the beginning that religiosity and piety has nothing to do with natural desires. We need to get out of our minds. Our Prophet like he likes to have good food, there's nothing wrong with him wanting to marry a lady. The perfection is he never ever did anything outside of marriage. That's the perfection. The perfection is he is controlling his desires and never even staring with a lustful stare. This is the perfection. The, the perception that especially many of our sisters have that he doesn't have any desires. Well, if you're going to study this next chapter, I'm sorry, you're going to find a lot of troubling things. Of course he did. He's a regular human being in a biological sense. Like he enjoys good food, every man will enjoy a good relationship as well. And he wanted to get married to a lady that he wanted to get married to. And sometimes those ladies were chosen because he found them attractive. And he found them attractive in a halal manner. You look at a lady and you're allowed to look and you're allowed to propose. If you find this to be problematic, well then I'm sorry, you really shouldn't attend the next chapters. Continue having your view and don't study these chapters. Because I'm not going to sanitize. Because if I do, then when you hear the truth, your perception of the Prophet will cause you to have doubts, not the truth itself. As for me, and I think I speak on behalf of most of the men here who understand this aspect, it actually makes us respect the Prophet more. Being a man and having access to whatever he wanted, he controlled his desires and he never acted in an indecent manner. And if he wanted to marry, he proposed. And sometimes, most of the time, they accepted once in a while. They didn't. No, there's no th nothing problematic at all. And the irony of ironies, dear sisters in particular, our mothers understood this better than some of you do. Our mothers knew our Prophet ﷺ better than modern women do. The famous incident that we will discuss in our own series now, Juwaidiyah, from the Banu Hilal, right? She was the daughter of the chieftain. And because she was the daughter of the chieftain, she had a sharp tongue and a sharp personality and an arguing and going on behalf of her tribe. She's the daughter of the chieftain. She's not some ordinary lady. And she was a young, Aisha says, beautiful lady. 
and she was going around arguing on behalf of her people who were all prisoners of war at the time, right? And she was going to go petition the Prophet ﷺ to release her own people. And Aisha said, I became worried. This is Aisha. Because if the Prophet ﷺ saw in her what I knew he would see in her, I thought he would propose. And that's exactly what happened. It's exactly what happened. Now, is it disrespectful? A'udhu Billah. Are you going to accuse Aisha of being disrespectful? It's only disrespectful for the lady or the man, sometimes young men might have this, who view the Prophet as not being a normal human being. Otherwise, I don't have any problem with it. It actually makes complete sense to us that young lady who had the qualities of a, uh, a, a leader and everything is there and she's the daughter of the chieftain and she's unmarried and the Prophet said, okay, why don't I marry you? Instead of you being a slave, why don't I marry you? And inshallah, your family will be freed. Your flight. And that's exactly what happened. Right? It's exact. Now, if you want to sanitize this and you say, oh, there was nothing of attraction here. He only did it to free all of her people. This leads us to problems. Number one, Aisha's statement in Bukhari and other authentic books of hadith. Number two, why didn't he do the same to other tribes that were captured? Why only this one? You see, when you set up the paradigm that is false, you dig your own hole, then you have to deal with it. And now that you know me, alhamdulillah, my time is almost up in this community, so I'm not going to make anything you know, hidden or whatnot. Nine years have gone, you know the reality. I don't mince my words. I don't think it's wise. Our Prophet is a regular human being in biological ways and he's the best of human beings in spiritual ways. There's no contradiction. And he himself said, Hadith is in Nisa'i and other books. The most beloved things of your world to me are women and perfume. And every man sitting here understands this. Why is that a problem? I don't have a problem with that, alhamdulillah. Those that do, the problem then is with your minds, not with the text here. So. The point is, when we start these discussions, we need to have this simple reality. Get this out of our minds, that somehow being attracted to a lady and wanting to marry her is somehow impious. No, it's not at all. And once you get that out of your mind, then inshallah, pretty much everything now becomes very easy to go. Our Prophet ﷺ, this is the perfection of perfection, never once acted in a flirtatious manner. Not even flirtatious. Never once had a lustful stare. Never once acted on an impulse of this nature. But did he want to marry a woman he was attracted to? Yes, he did. And there's nothing wrong with this. And many of our mothers, he saw qualities in them, physical and other than that, that attracted them to him. And he then proposed and the marriages took place. So we need to start with this realistic mindset especially as we get to some of the uh, stories afterwards. And of course, we have to conclude with this as obvious, and it is very true. If our process of A'udhu Billah, A'udhu Billah had been that type of person, he wouldn't have remained with Khadija for 25 years. As a younger man, he would have done whatever he wanted. But he was faithful to her and never married while she was alive throughout his 20s and 30s and 40s and early 50s. That is enough of an indication that that's not his main motivation. But to deny that as any motivation, it is problematic. And that's why I'm saying don't have that in your mind. He is clearly not interested in that to the level that is going to, no, but as a normal human being, there wasn't any problem in being finding something in Juwadi and then saying, I want to marry. And others, as we're going to come across as well in this regard. So with that, these disclaimers, inshallah ta'ala, we will stop here for today. And then next week, inshallah, we will start immediately with Khadija radiallahu anha. Go through all of the 11 that are confirmed. Once we're done with that, we'll move on to the milk yameen. Once we're done with the milk yameen, then we'll move on to the other categories that are uh, differences, as we mentioned, inshallah ta'ala. Any quick questions for what we have covered, inshallah, only what we've covered, not about the future topics. No, that is not the hadith, as far as I know. The hadith simply goes, 
the authentic version does not have this story before it. He's simply saying, from your dunya, the two things that have been made beloved to me are al-tib and al-nisa. And the sweetness of my eyes comes in the salah. And he said, from your dunya, to indicate that this isn't his number one priority. It is from your dunya, but it does give me peace and comfort of this world. Al-tib and nisa Okay. Inshallah, with that, we will pause for today and then continue, inshallah, next Wednesday.